Um, hello, I'm Sarah Weiner, uh, and I'm Senior Lecturer in the School of Education. I'm very pleased to be here doing this podcast this afternoon um, with three uh, women who uh, ended up as professors um, in higher education um, who came from working class background. I'll introduce them in a second, but the idea for this uh, conversation, which is going to happen, came from my interests and also a paper that I wrote with uh, one of the participants here, Gaby Weiner, who uh, is my mother, uh, about um, connections with you know ha uh, roots into high, um, ac political activity in higher education. And all three of the guests today have been politically active one way or another throughout their lives. Um, so I'd like to start off by introducing, uh, I'll, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Meg McGuire and I'm Professor of Sociology of Education at King's College and even though I'm in my 70s, I work one day a week for the university in a paid capacity. Um, I'm Gaby Weiner, Sarah's mother, and I have various, I've had various posts in higher education, uh, include, and I'm still a professor in Sweden, and I'm a visiting research fellow at Goldsmiths, but I have worked in for the Open University and for South Bank University and a few universities in Scotland. Hello, I'm Pat Marnie. I'm supposedly retired. I'm visiting professor at Goldsmiths and King's and I seem to be quite busy doing academic work. Well, thank you very much for those introductions. Um, the first question I, I'd like to ask, and I'll come to, come to you um, individually, is I described you as working class at the beginning. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about, about your family backgrounds and your upbringing? Can I start with you, Pat? Yeah. Um, my dad was a fitter and turner in a factory that made guns. Uh, my mum was a hairdresser. And I was an only child, but with a, a very large extended family, which generated something like nine cousins. Most of us lived very near each other, and we often used to play together. It was an extremely tight family on my mum's side. We were drummed down to my grandmother's every Saturday for tea, and you were offered a choice of shrimps and winkles or bacon and egg for your tea and uh, I could wag, wax lyrical for, about that family forever. It was wonderful. The Christmases were unbelievable. My grandmother had a shop, and when we all used to dance upstairs, the uh, floorboards would go up and down, and all the pots and pans would bang, and I can remember that to this day. So that was a jolly good beginning to life. Thank you very much. OK, well, mine couldn't sound more different. Um, in fact, I was the uh, child of refugees uh, from Nazi Europe. Uh, from, my father was from Poland, my mother was from Vienna, and they uh, met in London. And my father was deported after the war because he was a communist, and therefore I was brought up by my mother and her two sisters, and I was an only child. And I was, the, I think the biggest legacy of my childhood is I was loved because none of my uh, my mother certainly and my aunts never expected to have children, so I was I was protected and loved, and that's done me. A, you know that's protected me throughout my life. Um, we were not we we lived in Stoke Newington, which was then a working class area. We were poor, but I didn't feel poor. Never felt poor. Um, couldn't go on school journeys and those kind of things because we didn't have the money when I went to school. But uh, but had a you know uh, but had a a good childhood, I would say. Thank you, Meg. And my story is different again. Um, my parents were both from Ireland and they migrated to London and had four children in London and I'm the, the oldest. My dad did three jobs when we were growing up uh, to earn money. He was a tyre fitter, he worked making lampshades in the afternoon and he worked in a bar at night. My mum was a nurse until she had her children and we lived in post-war London so housing was an acute problem and my parents were migrants so they didn't qualify for council housing so we lived in a very, very small 
uh, a two-roomed flat. So the four children slept in one room and my mum and dad slept in what was the front room, living room. Um, and we were also poor. Um, but everybody that we lived with was mm. poor because we lived in, although I lived in um, what was called the World's End and it's now part of Chelsea, well, it was part of Chelsea then, so it sounds very posh, but it was a very poor area with lots of Irish migrants and everybody was really, really hard up. So everybody I went to school with was poor, but we didn't know we were poor because we were all the same. Um, and I was brought up in a very, very strong Roman Catholic environment. I went to Catholic schools and Catholicity was a core value in my childhood and in my family upbringing. And it's lovely to be here in Liverpool because my dad's, as, as everybody will know, my, dad's relative, my dad had relatives who came here to Liverpool because the, the Irish have always had to migrate. So it's a long-standing story for my community. Thank you very much. OK, I'm going to go and I'll ask, come to you first this time, Meg. Did you plan a career in higher education? No, I didn't. That, we, we talked about this question before, and it's a really interesting one. It's a vexed thing. What do you mean by a career? Um, is a career something that you look back on and you say, oh, yeah, I had a career? Um, when I was at school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I had a year, when I, I'd done my A-levels, and I had a year working for a charity in Shepherd's Bush, uh, with young kids who went to this youth club and, and couldn't read or write. And I thought, why, why is this happening? There's, there's something wrong here. There's something going wrong in schools. And I determined to be a primary school teacher, which is what I did. And I went into primary school teaching and I stayed there for 15 years. Um, and that was what I thought I was always going to do with my life. I always thought I was going to be in a school and somebody phoned me up from a place where I'd done my MA and they said, oh, have you ever thought about teaching teachers? And I hadn't. And I eventually got a job in higher education. And I felt, in a sense, I used to say, it's like I've died and gone to teacher heaven because I was in this fantastic old historical building. Um, and it was like a whole different world from the world of London primary schools that I'd worked in. Um, so no, I, it was a complete, I suppose it's a complete shock actually, it's a really interesting question. So no, it wasn't planned and it's interesting, is it accident, how does it happen, how some people and not others, was I just lucky, was I in the right place at the right time, I don't know, interesting questions. Mm. But people like me, that didn't, that wasn't what happened to them. Okay, people uh, from my background didn't do that. Yeah, okay, that's, that's really, and I think it's got some commonality with both Pat and Gaby. Um, Gaby, can you well, answer um, the same question? Well, I, um, I, um, I had children very young. I got married very young because that's the only way you could get sex. <laughs> um, and I had children very young. And uh, um, a friend of mine uh, went to uh, a local teacher training college um, and it was in the centre of London. I lived in London. And I applied the next year and got in. So I did my teacher training in the centre of London. And um, it, was a, it was a first time for a long time. I remember very vividly sitting down with adults, having a conversation with people actually recognising that I was a person rather than a mother. Uh, um, and uh, I did quite well at teacher training college. And I went to be a teacher, stayed for, th did it for three years. So I didn't do it as long as Meg. And then I decided I would, I was kind of, I think I've always been impatient. I've always mm. been kind of a bit, I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. So I, I applied to do a master's and at that time, I did it at the Institute of Education, at that time it, it wasn't the expenditure you have, you have now. It was, a, uh, really, I think it was 600 pounds. Mm. And I actually did supply teaching around it. So I managed to pay for it. And uh, after that, I decided, so in terms of career, my, it, it was never a career. It was doing something that I fancied or I was fed up with what I was doing or an opportunity arose. And so instead of going back to teaching, which you did after a master's, I went in, decided, well, I can always go back to teaching. That's always there. I will try and do other stuff. So I actually applied to the NFER, National Foundation of Education Research. They were very interested at that time as teachers, as researchers. It was a big thing. And of course, I'd just done a master's, done research methods. 
so they were quite they they employed <coughs> me and I worked on a primary school project and then I worked on a secondary school project and I was trying to remember and then my son once said to me you know you what are you doing you're like a missionary you're going out of London to do education and that kind of stung me a bit because I was always kind of fairly political so I came back and worked on what was called it was called TVI which is a technical and vocational educational initiative so I didn't go into higher mm. education quickly and I um and that was about working class kids having basic skills and then being introduced into jobs. In, and I did a lot of dining with bankers and it was a time of Thatcherism and investment. And, uh, and then because my masters a few years back had been, uh, my th dissertation had been about gender and I was one of the first to, r to write about gender. I was always very interested in it as very influenced by the women's movement. Um, uh, they'd, uh, the NFER, when I went to work there, published my final chapter. And I didn't have anything, I didn't know how to publish, I didn't know how, you know, they took my chapter and published it. And I didn't know, but the Equal Opportunities Commission, as was, used it in all their literature. You know, so suddenly I, I was known for this, which was entirely, mm. diff sorry, uh, entirely different from... Um, what my day job was, and I went to work for uh, schools council, and then and in it, and finally, um, but that uh, the Tory government closed that the schools council down, and then I went into higher education. Thanks very so much. So it's a bit of a journey. Sorry about yeah. that, but there's no, there was no intentional career. Yeah, it was just one thing after another. Thanks very much. I must be careful not to call you mum um, and listen to things about getting married to have sex. Um, a bit disturbing. Um, hat. That's what comes of not being a Catholic. <laughs> so I didn't um, at all have a concept of having a career. It, it never crossed my mind. I knew I'd got to earn some money because my dad said um, I didn't want to go into the sixth form to do A levels. I wasn't I wasn't good enough to go to university. I thought, and so there I was stuck. So what I actually did was a course in shorthand and typing, which was a complete disaster because my attempts to learn to type was like having bananas. It was I was hopeless, and the teacher divided the class into two. One half was her girls and the other half was the rubbish. And I was in the rubbish, and I was so affronted that my dignity was, was peaked that I decided that at the same time I'd do three A-levels. I was also playing badminton for Kent. So, predictably, I failed two of the A-levels and had to go back for another term. But then I got them, and I then got, a, uh, because I'd got the A-levels, I got a job with the Midland Bank on, in documentary cred credits which is the most boring, awful thing that you can ever do, especially since I was on the Middle East section, not the, even the French or German section, and it was terrible. Anyway, I gave that up after six months, and people kept saying, you ought to be a teacher, and I kept saying, no, I won't. Anyway, so I did a year's unqualified teaching, and after a year, what would I do? Well, of course, I went to college to train to be a teacher. And then I uh, got invited to um, apply, some years later, I got invited to apply for one of the Inner London Education Authority scholarships. They offered six scholarships for working class kids that hadn't been to university, and I got one of them. And since the lecture, lecturer that I'd had at training college said I kept asking very philosophical questions, I thought I'd better go and do a degree in philosophy, and that's what I did. So in three years, it was heaven. Absolutely loved it. Um, so that was my entry into higher education, because I then got a job teaching philosophy of education at Rachel McMillan College, which then amalgamated with Goldsmiths, where I stayed for the next 20 years and became head of department, which I hated. <laughs> Because it was all budgets, it was nothing to do with education. 
That, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Um, so, as women, um, what was it like in the 70s, 80s and 90s in universities? Um, we know there were very few female academics at the time, certainly many, many less than now. Um, did your background make a difference to you? And what, you know, what were your experiences? I know you're all feminists of, you're all feminists of one, one kind or another, um, edging towards the socialist side of fe- feminism. Yep. So how did that impact on what you did and in work, kind of barriers and uh, support really there for you? Can I go on this? Uh, yeah, if, you, yeah if yeah. you speak. Yeah. We, we annoyed a lot of people. We just annoyed, and it was very interesting because I was very involved in the British Educational Research Association, which what actually was very central to my career, if you're going to talk about career, because it was the, it was quite important to to present papers and to present your research there. And I made a bit, and I made a lot of friends there and it was a very good network. But we we pissed off a lot of people because we stood up and talked up always at meetings and asked what about the women. We misbehaved quite a lot of the time. We refused to do the 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 uh, <coughs> conform to the stereotype. I, I remember once going to uh, uh, my head of department saying, what do I need to get promotion? And he, he said, just do your job well. He would never have said that to a man, you know. So we were patronised, but we were, we were, they were very, they, um, a lot of women academics weren't feminists. They were, they'd gone in through their specialism. And so I think our generation, and then when we were young then, we created a dynamic, we supported each other, uh, and uh, I think uh, we were naughty at the time. Mm. And that's interesting because the paper we wrote was called um, <laughs> Your Trouble, You Are Just Like Your Mother, which is what a professor <laughs> said to me um, uh, uh, about 12 years ago when I finally left teaching and uh, came into higher education. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, Pat? Um, well, in the 70s, all the heads of department in universities were men. Yeah that I experienced. And the women just got on with the job and were, were, were invisible. A bit like classrooms with girls, in the invisible bunch. Um, and then in the 80s, things began to change because we started to write articles and books about the sexism that was going on in classrooms. I used to sit in the back of a classroom and watch a student teaching, the boys would be sticking their pencils through the the hole in the science uh, seat, and otherwise, uh, used to, I used to count the number of times that a teacher asked a question to girls uh, compared to boys, and so on. So I wrote a book called Schools for the Boys, and that took me into a different place in higher education, where the dean said, if you want to Pre, pre, um, preserve your career and maintain it, you've got to publish more. So that set me off on, on a train. But still, even so, in the 80s, I was not equal to any man in the department. In fact, I still made the tea. So if we had visitors uh, and there was a meeting, I can remember once there were several of us and I had both hands full of two cups and saucers and two cups and saucers. Where do you put the sugar bowl? Well, of course, you put it down your front, don't you? But then when I walked into the room and bent over to deliver the tea, the sugar bowl... So, yeah, so there were things like that about, you know, bodies that kind of got in the way. (laughs) Uh, The 90s made things perk up a bit more because I think women started um, achieving a much higher profile in universities and we started to write... I started to get um, uh, grants to do policy work and uh, made a bit of a nuisance of myself uh, criticising some of the government departments. So we were in a different era to the 70s. Um, You talked about, um, when we were talking before, about the impact of the Inner London Education Authority on your career. 
Can yeah. you add a, say something about that? Well, the Inner, Ed- Inner London Education Authority offered these scholarships in which I got a grant to do the degree which enabled me to go and stay in higher education, and that paid for my fees, it paid for my subsistence, for my travel, and for my books. It was fantastic. I mean, it was without that, I would never have gone. Okay. Because it, it kept me. Actually, it paid my, my mum and dad's rates as well, because they continued to be hard up. Thank you. Um, and Meg, can you talk about the same question then? Um, well, I was teaching in the well. 70s in schools, so I was working as a primary school teacher for the Inner London Education Authority. And it wasn't until the mid-1980s that I moved into higher education. And I went to work in what was then a very well-established teacher education college. And it was what was called, you know, um, it wasn't a university at that point. Uh, So it was what would now be, you know, post-92. And it is post-92 now. Um, And it was an interesting place to work because it, uh, a lot of the students were from working class families and they were the first in their generation to go into higher education. And one of the things that I experienced, and we talked about this as, as us three, was that as we were growing up, when we all hit about 18, I think something like um, 9% of people in the country went to university. And we were actually trying to remember what yeah. proportion of that percentage were actually female. Um, And it was much, much smaller. It certainly wasn't 50% of that 9%. So in our our growing up, going to higher education was a very elite experience. And gradually in the 80s and then into the 90s, it became a little bit more massified. So there were more people going. So I was working in a college which was a working class college, if you like. And I felt, I felt at home, I felt comfortable. Um, it was like the school I'd been in, the children and families I'd worked with. So I felt at ease in that culture. I didn't feel odd in any way. But just reflecting on the things that Gaby and Pat have said, in the education department where I worked, and we were the ones doing teacher education, and I was educating would-be primary school teachers, in the college we were called the educationalists. And then there were the academics who worked in their proper departments. So we weren't like proper um, academics. We were training teachers, and it was like a vocational job. In my department, and I, we were very big, and I'm going to say plus 30, I can't remember exactly, um, only two people had PhDs. And that was the head of department who was a psychologist who didn't do very much at all, and a very nice person who was a great mentor of mine, whose PhD was in sports science because that had been her professional background. So nobody had PhDs, nobody was expected to write, nobody was expected to publish. We were just expected, we were like teachers because we were right, had to be there at nine in the morning till five at night. We had to have notes on our door when we went out, when we were going out to school so everybody knew where we were. And our work was very controlled in that way and it was... Um, Very much, there were a lot of women working in it, and we were women who were coming in from schools, doing teacher education, and we did a lot of the domestic science. And by that, I don't just mean making the tea. We did a lot of the the labour work, the emotional labour work of looking after the students and nurturing the students. And gradually, what would happen was, and again, it was very, very sexist, men would say, well, I'm going to be starting to do a higher degree, and they'd be given lighter teaching loads, and we would pick up the slack. And it was very, very clear messages about who you were and, and what you were. Um, and obviously the bad news, of course, is that was relayed to the students because they weren't stupid and they can see what's going on. But that was, that was in the 80s and that gradually changed. And I moved from that college and I, it sounds like I didn't. I enjoyed it there. That some really great people there, some fantastic students that I'm still in touch with. I then moved into a very prestigious old university, which is where I've stayed and um, again, that was like, that was so strange because when I went there in the education department, again, there was this split in that university that there were vocational courses like nursing studies and education that weren't as perhaps prestigious. And they gradually were starting to become far more research active, 
money was being, there was money around for grants. So the whole context of higher education for me changed from going to one university to another university, Sarah. And what really shocked me was I was exactly the same person that I had been before, but all of a sudden, People wanted to know me. I was invited to Japan. Why don't you come to Japan and talk about whatever? Why don't you come to so-and-so? And suddenly, I became desirable, and I was exactly the same person. And it was the privilege of working in a different institution. And it hit me very, very powerfully, as did the fact that we had this old staff room on one of the campuses. And um, it was a staff room where women weren't allowed to go. And this is like in the early 90s. And I remember once in my university, we had, I'm sorry, I'm going on a bit long, but we had a magazine that was published, uh, which was an internal magazine. And basically at that point, I think 4% um, of professors in the country were women. Mm -hmm. And uh, my university celebrated and it said 4% of women, 6% at our university, hurrah! <laughs> you know, it was that, it's those times, and that's a long time ago, I know, but very much the culture was like that and the culture has has changed around education studies and I do think the discipline that you work in is quite important to take heed of um, but as I say my experiences of higher education in those two contexts are really quite dramatically different. Thank you Pat. I noticed an enormous difference when I moved from teaching, I was an infant school teacher and I inherited a class that were completely out of control. They were running in the door and out the window and round the school, <laughs> and, in, and that went on. And um, until I got chicken pox, and then they, they employed a supply teacher who told the kids that she was a witch, and that if they misbehaved, she would put a spell on them. And <laughs> so all I had to say to, to the class was, look, if you misbehave, you know, I can always get Miss Davenport back. It was instant silence. Mm. But it was very difficult. And moving from that context to this going to university with the Ilya Grant was just like going to heaven. Mm. It was just incredible. Because although I like the kids, I actually found the, the job of teaching exhausting mm. and intellectually unsatisfying. That sounds very snobby. I mean, I... I got sick and tired of saying, like, don't poo on the floor. Every day. It doesn't sound snobby at all, actually. Um, <laughs> yes, Gaby, just, Gaby. Just, uh, yes, just to uh, talk about different cultures from school to... Uh, I was working for a research institution. And I remember people would stop. They, I was working on a project, and people would stop and talk to each other. And they were kind of instead of being, you know, nailed to their desk, they would, they would walk around and talk. And, and, I, and I felt, well, I thought there was, you know, because in school, if you did that, you were felt to be yeah. skiving, you know. Off. So it was a huge privilege, and I've never forgotten it, to be able to talk to colleagues without actually feeling that you were somehow not yeah. supposed to. And I think that's mm. the kind of form of control that's exercised on teachers, and I think probably is so now as well, mm. as opposed to people in higher education. The other thing I, I remember from that in research institution is when I worked there, I had to hide the fact that I had children because I would be criticised for, you know, I'd be, I'd be told to stay at home if I couldn't look after them, which is why... Sometimes I maybe neglected my own children, but the 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 um, men in the department were often went off early because they had to pick their mm. children up, and it was kind of somehow it was okay for them, but it wasn't okay for me. So I thought that was a, those mm. were memories that you mm. you you hold for a long time. Mm. Thanks. Can I sort of segue back into part of this question, which is about our backgrounds making a difference? Because I think that's a very interesting question. When I went to the first higher education institution that I worked in, um, my background as an Irish working class Catholic person meant that I felt quite comfortable there. Even if I didn't always agree with everything, I knew I could read the culture and I, fit it, I could fit in and I could be okay. And I felt very strong empathy with my students because they were me and I was them and I, I knew their story and, and my story was the same. So I felt emotionally in class terms 
that I was in a comfort zone, but it wasn't just class, it was other aspects of my identity. When I moved to um, the next university, what I found was really interesting, it's something again that us three have talked about, is that um, I was still a woman from a working class background. I was still a woman who'd been brought up in London in relative poverty. Um, I understood what it was like to have, have problems around housing, to have problems around clothing, to have problems around work, all the sorts of things that are still with us but with knobs on. When I went to that university, what was very interesting was that I'd already been working in higher education for four years and I have a particular accent. And my accent is not phony and sometimes it sounds very um, RP, received pronunciation. So people think that I'm privileged because of the way I speak. And I think that's an interesting thing, how you pass and how you, are you passing or are you being yourself? Or what, what am I supposed to be if I'm working class? How am I supposed to speak? How am I supposed to look? Am I supposed to look poor? Am I supposed to have a certain accent? Does that denote my class? My voice is the way it is because when my parents came to this country, my parents both had what were euphemistically called brogues, soft Irish accents. And when my mother had been nursing, my mother had saved her money and she went to a shoe shop to buy some shoes. And she'd saved up for these shoes and she went into the shoe shop and it was only a shoe person selling. It wasn't anybody fancy or anything, but my mum felt intimidated by this English voice and this person basically was rude to my mother and pretended she couldn't understand my mother's voice. So my mother, with her savings that she flogged her guts out for, bought a pair of shoes that killed her feet that she couldn't wear because she didn't have the bottle. You know, it's, yeah. it's very intimidatory if, if somebody yeah. sort of mocks the way you speak and pretends Absolutely. they can't. Mm. So one of the things that my mum did was she made sure that all of us children um, spoke in a particular way. So um, my parents would sometimes say, oh, don't say this or don't say that. And um, so I have a voice that I have. I can really lay it on thick if I have to. So if I go to certain places, I can pass in terms of my class identity. So people will look at me and they think they know me. And if I say I was brought up in Chelsea, which is now very fancy, um, if people who know the area, and I say I was brought up in the World's End in the 1950s, next door to a bomb site, and people were living in prefabs, and it was like this, and etc., people don't believe it. But So it's sort of interesting, because I am in a really fortunate or unfortunate position, which is that I can pass in class terms. So I can fit into places and people will think I'm like them. And I can think, you know, it's all right, I don't have to go through what my mum did with her voice mm. or whatever. Um, and so I can be what I want to be sometimes. And then, of course, I position myself in class terms because I'm an activist, but I will be positioned in class terms by my students in different ways because of my embodied self, because of my voice, maybe because of my age and because I've got that thing called professor in front of my name. Mm. So people think they know me and they think they can class me. But, you know, how does your background make a difference? I can be playful with my background and I can pass. And that isn't available to everybody. Mm. I mean, that reminds me of um, a conversation I had with Gaby some time ago, who I just want to call mum, um, but Gaby some time ago about um, how a voice changes and changed mm. um, or not and uh, I remember her, um, her telling me that her voice was different when she was in big meetings with uh, you know high-ranking professors etc um, so mm. you know and and you Pat you've still got a very strong working class accent yeah well I South, South London South London South London when I first went to training college in Deptford, which was a very, very poor part of the poorest London borough at the time, um, I was forced to have elocution lessons <laughs> because I didn't speak properly. I spoke like the kids. And um, I had to sit in front of a mirror and into a tape recorder say, oh, eh. Anyway, that evening, my, and I did have to do that every week, um, my, aunt, my aunt used to phone up because she'd taken over the shop, my grandmother's shop, and I gave her the, the, the order in my new accent. 
And she said, oh my, haven't we gone posh? <laughs> and I couldn't do it after that. Yeah. I absolutely couldn't do it. So I went back mm. to how I am. <laughs> yeah. But people, a professor once did tell me, if only you spoke properly, you'd go far. Yeah. I was. Can I just say, I was told, if only you change your name, you'd go far. Mm. If only you'd stop being a feminist, you'd go, you know, the, all these. Mm. And once I was in Cambridge doing something and somebody said to me, oh, you sound so London. Which meant, you know, sound so common. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, the acad academia has a good way of putting you down. Yeah. Mm. If and if you fit, and I, one of the things I think we've all had to do is be much very tough mm. and just not be knocked back by those kind of remarks. Mm. Otherwise, we would have given up. Yeah. The um, thing is, they never say to you, "Well, you're a bit vol rough," but that's what they mean. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I ended up with a first class <laughs> honours degree in philosophy, but I'm still a bit of old rough. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting, the whole thing about uh, students um, learning and engaging with people who talk like them mm. uh, much more. Mm. And, you know, at John Moore's, we've got, we have, you know, working class kids, students um, here, and... It feels that we're able to talk to them a bit more, but sometimes the language that we use is, isn't is something they can connect with, and I think that's an overall issue. Mm. Um, I'm going to move on now, um, and obviously come back and talk about these things. Mm. Um, when you were... Did, did you and do you see yourself as activists in any way, either with, within or without the uh, academia and the university and do you think that you are continuing to do or did have an impact um, I know it's sometimes uncomfortable talking about things like that in terms of we don't want to blow our own trumpets but I think it's very important mm. and I'll start off with Pat um, well I knew that schools for the boys that had documented the way in which girls were suppressed by the behaviour of the boys, which the teachers failed to moderate. I knew that had had a, a, an impact when the Daily Express <laughs> phoned me up, followed by the News of the World, with a headline that said, Sex in the Classroom. <laughs> uh, and that was difficult to handle, really. If only, eh? It really did. <laughs> Sorry. It, I weird. was trying to cultivate this, this educated, scholarly image and that really didn't didn't mm. cut it. The other impact I think I had because I did I did become a feminist and and I did go on a recline reclaim the night march where we glued up the locks of of sex shops <laughs> and I was so freaked that I would be arrested and my poor children were <laughs> back at the ranch would be left without their mother that I never did anything ever again. I was good as gold from then on. But the, the, except when I painted on the walls of Greenwich Park. <laughs> woman's right to choose. And then I was frightened I'd be arrested again. So I, I had this fear mm. of losing my children, which really socially controlled me. Mm. Thanks. Um, I'm going to come to you now, Gaby. Yeah. Um, well, I was always very conscious of being an activist. Uh, really, fr in, in I mean, I was always interested <coughs> in politics. <coughs> uh, uh, and my parents, I, had, I told, told you my father had been a communist, my mother was a social democrat who'd been forced out of Nazi Austria. So I had, a, and I had a very good socialist grounding. My family were political. But um, when I... Was a teacher, I um, and when I was at the schools council, I talked about being a teacher researcher, and that was very powerful for me. And uh, we built our gender. We did this gender project, and we built it around teachers as researchers, mm -hmm. because that was very much a model of that period, which was the nineteen eighties. And it was a big. And in the end, we had the biggest mailing list of the whole of the schools council because we kind of touched on a kind of nerve. And so we were producing materials and we had conferences. And uh, it was, it, so we became very active and we had a group in London, which was very active, Wedge, if you remember, Women in Education Group. And um, so 
I was very conscious that we had to work with teachers, that you couldn't just work in academia. And I used to have a lot of arguments with people about whether teachers would read the material we produced. So that was one thing. Um, and I think uh, when we were, when I was writing, again, my, my, the book that made most impact, I suppose, was um, just a bunch just of girls. Bunch, thank you. Just a bunch, <coughs> a bunch of girls, which is a collection of uh, articles by teachers, really, about gender, and it became an OU set book. Well, I worked at the OU, um, and and also um, OU summer school, which was amazing mm. because the OU had these summer schools built round modules, and I taught on a gender module, and. Uh, People said, you know, I remember asking somebody to talk about, we were trying to sell our module to other OU students, and this woman got up, Jackie Bryan, and said it yeah. changed my life. You know, it's changed my life. Mm. So we were very conscious that, that we were impacting on other people. We were impacting on ourselves as well. And, you know, for, so a lot of us got divorced or changed our lives or changed mm. our a sexual orientation, or we did a lot of things. But yes, yeah, so so the activism was in our private lives and in our mm. professional lives as well. Um, thanks, um, Meg. Um, it's, it's, I'm not going to play with words, but it's interesting. Like, what do we really mean by an activist? And I think that's an interesting thing. Mm. And some people would argue that the act of writing is yeah. an act of resistance. Yeah and an act of defiance, and at particular times in history we know that and we've seen that. So some people would say that academics who write about social justice, who document the inequalities that surround them, are activists in their working lives, and that's their, their, their teaching is an act of resistance because it is documenting, recording, reporting, um, and that's one thing. But the second thing is in my own life. Um, I've always been a, a trade unionist uh, because I think that that's where working people have historically come together to fight. And I think that, so I've never known anybody in, t in school teaching who wasn't in a union because you have to be in a union. And when I, when I was at college training to teach, uh, it was free to join the union. Everybody joined the union when I was at college and I was a member of NUT for a very long time. And NUT, back in the day, and I'm talking now in the 1970s, was part of the big anti-racist movement in London. Yeah. It was uh, very active around gender. It wasn't very active at all around class, which is a very interesting thing in terms of analysing its policies, yeah. and I think we will probably agree on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, NUT was very active. Um, it stood against... Um, anti-democracy in education, it fought for rights for children and their families to empower them and to enfranchise them and so therefore being part of the union wasn't just about defending my own rights as a worker in the workplace, which of course it was, and about fighting for better conditions and we actually did well in teaching because we were talking about how poorly we were paid mm. when we all started teaching. Some of us had to do part-time jobs to supplement our income when we were starting teaching. So when I moved into higher education, of course I joined, I've just transferred. So I joined um, NAPFI when I moved into the first college that I worked in. I was woman's officer, I was London rep and things like that. So I was active as a, 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 a member of the union. And mostly, as you know yourself, a lot of the work in your workplace is around casework. Uh, and because that is where you, where you actually prove that a union is worth being part of because somebody comes to you and they say, I've got a problem, you're in the union, can you help me? And so you try to. And that means that you hopefully draw them into union membership and the collective is, is stronger yeah. than, than individuals, do you know? Uh, and I, I, I think that we are many, they are few, and mm. that's what a union has always been about for me. So when I moved into the next type of university, I obviously changed unions, and it was AUT, which was called the Association of Un University Teachers. And it was like a professional association, <coughs> it wasn't like a union. And I, you really notice the difference. And what I've been noticing recently, because we have now been um, on strike and taking action for five years, and I feel that five years of action, five years of standing on picket lines early in the morning in the freezing cold. Why is it always in the cold? I don't know. Why is it always in winter when we're on the picket lines? So, you know, for me, that is part of being an academic. 
I model activism to my students by being there visibly on the picket line, by withdrawing my labour from their classes, to hopefully say to them, you too, this is you, this is you, I pass this on to you. Um, so yeah, um, it depends what you mean by being an activist. Um, whether I've made an impact, that's a different question. Okay, we'll come back to that, Pat. What we're missing is our, our activism wasn't, or our behaviours, mm. weren't uh, an individual thing. We actually Absolutely. gained a lot of support mm. from each other, mm. not just us three, but mm. you know, you knew that if you, what you did was thought to be too mm. radical or whatever, you'd have the support of other women. Mm. For instance, uh, other feminists. Yeah. Sorry. For instance, no. I was given. A, sorry to interrupt. That's okay. I mustn't interrupt. I was uh, um, advised by a colleague that if I was going to, in, in a professional capacity, that if I was going to be radical, or I'm going to be make, make kind of demands on the audience, I should dress very conventionally. Yeah. So I've always brought that. That basically, the stronger you want to be in a delivery of your topic, the more conventional you have to look. And men, of course, never have that. Maybe they do. Maybe it's the same for, for men. Or, but I've, I think that's... And I've always also, and people will know this, I've, I'm very conscious of the audience that I've dealt with, how you behave with different kinds of audience. I always wore lipstick in big meetings, in university meetings, because there was always, you know, if they, if they didn't mm. notice you, you were just a mid, another middle-aged woman. So you know you ha so I've be always been strategic in my appearance. Our bodies are a very important. Mm. Sarah's shaking her head here. So that's mm. something I've learned, and I think it's mm. quite important. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, men do have to, if they want something, smarten up, put on a suit and a tie, and, mm. but they don't have to put on shoes that they can hardly walk in and a skirt that they have to keep pulling down because it's showing too much leg. I mean, they don't have to completely change their wardrobe, whereas women do. Mm. I mean, I agree. Um, it, it, yeah, I, I find it difficult finding clothes in my wardrobe which are appropriate yeah. for teaching uh, my students and being at university. Meg, have you got anything to add to that? I don't think I have. Okay. I mean, one of the things that I found really interesting when we were talking last night... Um, was the discussion on how influential you'd all been oh. on each other's careers um, and that whole kind of movement of feminism in the you know upsurge mm. in the 70s and 80s had really kind of pushed you mm. and a group of you into a place that you'd never imagined you could possibly mm. be. Um, does anyone want to talk about that a little bit, Meg? Well, I, I think that's really interesting because I think at the end of the day, nobody can do anything on their own. Yeah. And I think that's really very important. And um, part of my story is these two people. And when I first moved into higher education, um, I was just like a, bit like a teacher. I was still like a school teacher. And that was my mindset and that was the expectations where I worked. And um, it was actually Gaby who helped me with one of the first papers I ever wrote and published. And she got hold of it. She got out her pen and she said, no, you can't say that. And she edited it. And from what was like nothing, I had a, a lovely golden paper there. And uh, we published together. And what was really lovely was one of our old papers that, that some, a journal has just done a special golden edition of our best papers. <laughs> and we were really knocked out because the paper that we did together was picked for that. But, uh, you know, you, you learn off the shoulders of other giants. I went to a women's studies conference and I saw that there was this workshop about working class women. And I'd never been to a conference where there was anything about working class people. Um, so I thought, I, I must go to this, and there was Pat chairing this, and we all crawled in, uh, the, the five working class women who were there, or whatever. But, um, <laughs> and again, that was really interesting, because Pat, down the line, not far off that, was um, writing a collective book, and she was asking women like myself to write chapters about our lives, about being working class women, and she said to me, would you like to do a chapter? And I was just knocked out. And so what I do want to stress is that feminisms, which is us supporting and looking after yeah. each other and mentoring each other and 
that really did make a difference to me, learning to write, being helped to publish. Yeah. And the chapter that I wrote for Pat's book, um, on our undergraduate course, they use it as a biography of a working class woman. So uh, thank you very much. But that, that, for me, was really, really important and fundamental. You don't do it on your own. It's the people who mentor you. It's the people who use their expertise, not to put you down, but to pull you up. And that's what these both did for me. And remember, I went into higher education behind these two. Thank you, Gaby. Um, I have had the honour of working with all these, so I've mm. actually joint, written joint papers. Mm. But when I went to Sweden and I had to submit a whole load of publications, I was criticised for writing with other people. Oh. They said, yeah. where, you know, so I had to send my, my thesis, I had to... So it's kind of interesting. It worked mm. against me. It, it works mm. with you in one some mm. sense, and then it against you in another. But mm. I did get the job, so mm. it didn't. She was it, didn't right. it didn't. Yeah. It didn't uh, floor me totally. Mm. And I, I have to say that I agree about um, Gaby's very strong editing um, abilities. Mm. So Absolutely. yeah, it certainly helped me yeah. in my and academic to just career. And me returned the favour because she became the editor of a journal. <laughs> yes. And then, if you submitted something that was below par, she'd give you really, really helpful feedback to make it better. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. So, I mean, I think the final question, and I suspect this might um, be maybe the largest section, um, what are your hopes and fears about the future of education and specifically higher education? I don't know who wants to start on that. Where is the time and the space for students to be able to study different theories of women's oppression? Where's the space to do that? Teachers I'm talking about. How much time do they get on the theory? Don't forget theory became a dirty word under Thatcher. Mm. I can remember her saying, oh, and they're talking about anti-racist mathematics, whatever that is. Well, if she hadn't been so arrogant, we would have explained what it was. Mm. But all that, we were supposed to adopt a theory of teacher training, which wasn't a theory at all, called Sit by Nelly. So you just learn it by... Osmosis. Watching, yeah. Mm. So you couldn't do any, any uh, much uh, work on how mm. children learn, on how to be fair in the classroom. We weren't asking to, I mean, somebody said to me, oh, you should have been teaching children to read. I thought I was, mm -hmm. but I wanted the girls to read as well as the boys. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, um, uh, initiative teacher training sits in uh, my the school of education mm. where I work. And, you know, they are, uh, don't get me wrong, the, the lecturers are, are brilliant mm. at, trying to get theory in some of these stuff. But, you know, it's much more instrumental now. And it's they have all these competences mm. they have to, yeah. which have got nothing to do with the theory of learning. Um, gem generally, they've got to do with, you know, how do you control the kids and do you yeah. get the curriculum across? So I think that, you know, that that's absolutely right, thinking about that. Um, and the impact. And where are women's studies? What Women's studies doesn't exi exist no. anymore. When we first introduced it at Goldsmiths, one of the chaps in the, 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 the other lecturer said, oh, we'll be having, be having budgerigar studies next. Uh, yeah, it's in, and they've, of course, shut down the only... Uh, at Chichester. They're, they've shut oh, down the only um, uh, master's course in um, uh, African studies mm. and diaspora studies uh, in the country. Um, sacking the only you know the the black mm. professor who mm. who started it. Um, yeah, go on. <coughs> well, I I was a little bit. I mean, I've been I've been out. I was went to Sweden in 1998, and um, and worked there for about mm. seven years, and then I came back to Scotland before I came back to England. So I've been out of the mm. English system quite a long time. But I what I think my longevity has shown is that there's waves that policy changes all the time and we've had a really bad period of neoliberalism marketization of everything yeah. but that seems 
I might be wrong, that seems to be collapsing in, in the economy anyway. There's going to be much more state intervention, I would imagine, after this mess of recent governments. So I, I see waves, and we're going to Sweden, where theory is very highly valued, very highly valued. So I had to be terribly theoretical there. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm much more of a, my, writing's very important to me, and making my writing accessible is very important. I remember having long arguments with very theoretical sociologists about our writing, because I said, these are, teachers have got to read this. And so I've always been very kind of passionate, which is why I do the editing because I think writing is a political action mm. as well, mm. as I think Meg mm. said. Um, but in Sweden it was very interesting because I was um, recruited to be part of a gender, they were very interested in my gender work, much more so than they were in this country, mm. And but they were trying to raise the status of teacher education, and so it was becoming, they wanted, you know, post-doctorates and doctorates, and there, there was huge resistance in, in teacher education itself. So you mm. see the, the tussle between theory and practice. And I just, I just wonder, I'm not so, quite so pessimistic. Mm. I, th I think we will see. I'm not so pessimistic about uh, the inevitable dumbing down in, of everything. In terms of hopes and fears, my fears are... Um, that Pat would not get a scholarship today. No, that's true. You might not have had the opportunities that you had, and neither might I. I fear because of the costs for mm. young people coming through the system. We're looking at people leaving university with like 40,000 quid in debt, I mean, massive debts that they carry through their lives. Um, I, I worry that it may well revert to the situation that it was when I was young, which was that only certain people could go to university because yep. only certain people could afford to go to university and the expectations change. Or that some people will go and do some courses that might not be um, like philosophy. They might be like practical courses and fit them up for jobs and they will be put in, into the labour market in a situation where they will only have a certain amount of mobility. So I wonder about the future of education, and on a bad day I feel very pessimistic because of those sorts of fears and concerns. Um, I also have fears and concerns about the labour market and notions of what is or isn't a graduate job and those sorts of things for what's happening. But then my hopes are, um, again, in my in my place, uh, and I've been lucky maybe, but all the students I've met give me hope. These young people who are, you know, they want a better world. They want yeah. to make a difference. They want a decent life for themselves and their families, and what's wrong with that? But they want a decent life for other people. And I see that things like social trends research, um, young people seem to be kinder maybe than some of my generation. Young people seem to be more emotionally intelligent in certain ways and more thoughtful and more caring in certain ways and better informed emotionally. And I think that my hope is that there are going to be some great people there who are really going to make more of a difference maybe than we've been able to make in our time. Yeah. Which sounds a bit romantic and Pollyanna-ish, but um, that is where I would put my money on... on some of these young people who are struggling for the rights of different people who are working, yeah. who are activists on the streets, who are working with families, who are working in food banks, who are working to make things better for people and studying as, as best as they can. So that, those are my hopes. Thanks. Um, Pat? I think it's um, quite... I find it very depressing to see young people with those hopes and altruistic mm. approaches to other people still stuck with twenty thousand pounds to have to do to if they want to do a master's i didn't have that pressure mm -hmm. of, of you've got to get this mm. and you've got to pay back for twenty thousand it must constrain no wonder they're in a hurry mm. to get what they need to get the qualification mm. and i think that's sad and i i think that um, it's reflected in some way in students in the classroom mm. yeah. who 
their aim is to pass mm. their degree in yeah. order to be able to move on rather than a mm. kind of the general thirst for knowledge mm. that I had, for example, mm. when I did my um, uh, undergraduate stuff mm. in um, the late 80s, early 90s, mm. um, which I think is inevitable in, mm. in the way that they're being forced to pay mm. these things and working while mm. they're studying. Yeah. Um, I'll go for Gaby and yeah. then I'll come to you. Well, just, I just think that we also um, shouldn't um, deny the fact that individual teachers can make a difference mm. and mm. can it really be inspiring. And, and I think that in the, uh, what do we do in the horrible world we live in at the moment is the only thing you can do is you can do what my mother used to call, you can do your best. I mean, and uh, I remember once when I was uh, doing teacher training and I mentioned that I was, a, uh, I was, a, my mother was, a, I was in a single parent family, brought up in a single parent family. You know, it's passing. Mm. And a student came up to me afterwards and said, thank you for that. Nobody's ever mentioned that in any of the lectures mm. we've had. And so it's the kind of things that you, you don't even know you're doing mm. that you can make a difference. And I think we should hold onto that as educators because, and as writers mm. and as researchers, because mm. otherwise we just, we just get depressed. And mm. you know, that's no good to anybody either. Thanks, Meg. I suppose I was looking at the question and thinking about the distinction between education and higher education. And not all higher education is educative, and not all education in schools is much more than schooling. And I think that, that that's one thing. And I was thinking about schools where I know brilliant head teachers who do fantastic jobs with their children and fantastic jobs with their students, and great school teachers who believe in their kids and want to inspire them to, to go on and do better. And I think that the future of education, when there are people like that around, I feel very hopeful and positive about. Um, higher education has always changed, um, and so has school education, and they always will. And I, I think it's an interesting question if you're asking about education and higher education of us, because we've all worked as school teachers and we've worked in maybe sociology or but certainly sociology of education and gender and education but we've always been uh, committed to education within higher edu education mm -hmm. and it'd be interesting to, to sort of think about well if we talk to somebody who for example worked in just say history or worked in medicine maybe we'd get a different response to this but I think our responses are very much shaped by our identities and by our experiences in these disciplines myself mm. and the discipline of course was very much gendered when we mm. entered it so I mean we were school teachers mm. and that's that's we were school teachers for a reason mm. and uh, so uh, you know it, it was all highly gendered mm. and uh, yeah, the fact we've kind of come out of it some with some kind of record is a is a, mm. I think is a miracle to be honest. Mm. I mean, I think that you underplay underplay mm. um, your the significance of what you've done um, as academics, as working class academic women in higher education, because um, now there are many more women. Mm. Um, and I mean there's still a huge amount of work to do in diversity mm, um, I mean absolutely. we wanted this to be much more inclusive than it is but finding for mm. example you know black female professors to come mm. and or uh, academics to come and talk who could you know afford to give up their own time to do that because mm. obviously this you're not being paid to do this um, is really is really was really a challenge despite the connections that you've you've had um, but I wouldn't want you to think that your role has gone unnoticed mm. or has been in any way unimportant because there are a huge range of academics now who have built on the work that you've done um, and hopefully there'll be more coming through and I agree with you and I think you're right but I think there's also a, there's a very old paper by Peggy McIntosh and it's called Feeling Like a Fraud. And it's about working class women in whatever context they're in, working in universities. And always you're looking over your shoulder thinking, God, 
did, did they make a mistake? It's not really supposed to be me. Now, I'm not saying that women from other class backgrounds mm -hmm. don't have those feelings of being fraudulent and being the wrong person, you know, that, that a mistake was somehow made on that day when you got that job or they, they forgot that you hadn't done something. So you're always waiting to be found out and waiting to be found short of something. And because I'm not a, a man, I don't know, I'm sure some men must feel like that in, in the workplace in higher education. But I know an awful lot of women who I know as being successful in academia who still feel like a fraud and are still waiting for somebody to say, hey, you <laughs> should, it, you're, you know, it's caught you out. Caught you out. And I think that that may well be a, a, a function of class, but I, I don't know because I've only got my own identity here. Yeah. I would disagree. Oh, I've, they good at I've <laughs> never felt that. Okay. I've never yeah. felt a fraud. No, because it's been such a, you know, you knew how the bastards are. You knew, you know, if you've got, you know, I had an analysis. I knew what I was, mm. in a way, from quite an early on. That's maybe because I had a political upbringing. Mm. So, and maybe, you know, a Jewish survivor chutzpah kind of argument. Mm. But, you know, I never felt a fraud. I always mm. felt, I don't feel mm. that I got what, you know, I was, mm. I was, supposed to succeed in dramatically but I never felt whatever I got to or whatever mm. I did I felt you know I felt you know if, you know I did it mm. <laughs> and but I just not I deserve to do it mm. but you know I got the background to do it yeah. but then I've always I when I first went into higher education I never went to graduation ceremonies because I used to look at all those people in their gowns and chucking hats in the air and everything and I used to think, all the kids I've taught who aren't in this room graduating, who are smarter than you lot, <laughs> and they're not here because of poverty, yeah. being excluded, so I'm not going to celebrate you, which was mean. And I never have been to my own graduations. I've never graduated because I feel like I don't want to be triumphalist because I know loads of children that I've worked with as a teacher who were smarter than me, but I was just older than them and maybe I was luckier than them. So I've always felt a bit... Um, uncomfortable with, with some of that stuff and I still do to this day I now do go to graduation ceremonies uh, for different actually because I was pulled in by one of my line managers who said you need to go to these because you know blah blah blah, blah, blah. but it's like I've always those sorts of things I've always felt uncomfortable about because it, they feel like all the other people who are not in that room who I know could be in that room who are capable of being in that room who are not in that room because of class and that for me feels really quite powerful. So I'm sometimes embarrassed to be in that room, sitting on that stage. For me, the issue isn't how I feel. Yeah. It's knowing where the power is, and it's not with me. Mm. That's a really interesting way to, I think, finish off this discussion. Um, it's gone in directions which I hadn't, I certainly hadn't, uh, thought it would go into and I think it hopefully we can work together in developing this kind of discussion as an idea for future academic writing um, but in a way which is ac accessible to people who maybe don't have that background where they remember the difference between epistemology and ontology <laughs> um, it's something that I can't do I don't know why it's uh, yeah do you know what there's a game you don't need to remember it yeah. We'll have a talk afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, thank you very much for your insights um, and your conclusions were more hopeful mm. than I certainly feel at the moment working mm. in higher education. Um, and I think many of us do feel as if we're imposters all the mm. time. Um, but that's something to discuss at a different time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the technical team. <laughs>